talk about the tar pit, how to avoid getting into the tar pit, and once you're in it, how to get out of it gradually. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, and basically anywhere with the handle eTagWorker. So if you have questions about this after the conference, feel free to reach out to me. Now, I am originally from Argentina. I moved to Philadelphia about three years ago. And uh, if you find that I say some words that are just sound funny, it's because English is not my native language. So just uh, be patient. Now, I'm an outsider here. Like I know of Solidus, and I have used Spree in the past, but I can say that the most experience I have with Solidus is that I also once forked Spree. And that was about seven years ago. Now, I'm the founder of a small software development shop called Ombu Labs. Ombu Labs is a custom software development shop. We like to work a lot with Rails, Ruby, JavaScript, and we are fully distributed. Like we have team members in Argentina, Brazil, Guatemala, Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia. Our main office is in Philadelphia. Now, a few years ago, we found that we were doing a lot of Rails upgrades, and we decided to launch a service based on that. We called it fastruby.io. And basically, we help companies upgrade their Ruby on Rails applications um, from X to Y. All of our clients know that they need to upgrade. They have the budget, but they just don't have the time. They have teams of two developers, and they have teams of 40 developers, but the same problem comes over and over again. Rails upgrades get postponed and delayed indefinitely. Now, every week, we need to quickly assess the quality of a Rails project. And in order to do that, we have to work on the process. And FastRuby.io is basically that one really fine-tuned process. And a lot of the insights for this talk come from our experience there. Now, when I'm not working on those two companies or services, um, I like to work on open source. To be honest, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't thanks to open source, so, so great to be here. I maintain a few gems that you might have heard of. Um, Database Cleaner is a library that helps you clean or keep a clean state between test runs. Um, Bundler Leak is a gem that helps you find leaky dependencies in your um, gem file. And Next Rails is a toolkit that helps you upgrade your Rails application. It knows how to find incompatibilities, and it knows how to make it easy for you to dual boot your application. If you're inter interested in any of those, uh, come talk to me after my talk. Now, the inspiration for this talk is a book that I read many, many years ago um, at college. And it's by Fred Brooks, and it's called The Mythical Man Month. In the very first chapter, he talks about the tar pit. And he talks about prehistorical beasts getting stuck in the tar pit. And there are phrases like this one, like the fiercer the struggle, the more entangling the tar. And no beast is so strong or so skillful, but that they ultimately sink. Now, it's a great analogy, and he used that analogy with um, large system programming. He talked about the struggles that over the past decade, uh, said beasts have been stuck into. The funny thing is that this book was published in 1975. So he's talking about the past decade being 65 to 75. And a lot of the problems that he mentions there are still around today. Fred Brooks is also the author of No Silver Bullet, a great essay that I recommend everybody reads. And it talks about us having a lot of problems in terms of software development. And it talks about there not being a, sim a silver bullet that solves everything. So there's no, it's not a technological problem. It's more like a process problem. It's more of a culture problem. And it's like fascinating. 
And okay, he's talking about large system programming, but we can bring this to today and talk about e-commerce applications, Rails applications. And I believe that we're in two states. We're either in the tar pit and trying to get out, or we're trying to avoid it. So that's why I wanted to talk about this today. And sometimes we make efforts to get out of the tar pit, right? And sometimes it looks like this, you know? The more we struggle, the harder it gets. <laughs> and then we just die or we switch jobs, okay? So let's bring it back to reality, okay? This analogy is great um, and this GIF is even better. <laughs> but the tar pit comes up in our day-to-day -day with things like this, like projects running over budget not even knowing when we're going to ship a feature because we don't understand the underlying architecture. Taking forever to ship what the client thinks are small changes, you know? We're like, yes, of course, that should take two hours and then two days into the change, we don't know when we're going to be done. And it comes up when we sacrifice quality and we decide to increase technical debt every week. And then we don't save time in every sprint to pay that technical debt off. So this talk is divided in two parts. First, how can we avoid the tar pit? In your career, if you haven't been in this situation, you might be in the near future where a boss comes up to you and they tell you, yeah, if you could come in on this great, great legacy project, and maintain it from now on, that would be great. Yeah, okay. So we get our boss and they tell, they're they telling us that the project is great and that they need us to maintain it. And for fastruby.io, it looks more like this. It's like client comes up to us and they tell us they need to upgrade their Rails application. And as much as I would want to believe and trust this client, I need to look at the source code because I need to understand what it is before I can answer the next question, which is going to be something like this. So how long is it going to take? Uh, because yeah, I need it by end of day today. So I urge you to never ever answer this question right away. Take your sweet time and say, I'll get back to you. And then you can go in and check the code quality of the project. So the part one is gonna be like, how can we assess code quality without you know, having many opinions? Like having actually tools that judge every application the same way over and over again. Part two is going to be about getting out of the tar pit. Let's say that we can't really say no to our boss. We need to take the project, okay? But the only way that we can be sane maintaining the project is if we can gradually pay off technical debt. So then part two is gonna be about building on top of part one and saying, okay, how can we pay off technical debt gradually without having to stop for like three weeks? All right, let's get started. So same situation, boss comes up to you and they're like, yeah, Carl quit. He's the only one who knows the, how to program the legacy system. It can't be that hard to fig, you know, go figure it out, right? Yeah, and that's what bosses like to say. And in our industry, it looks more like this. It can't be that hard. You know, it's a Rails project, so go figure it out. But it's not like that. We've seen so many Rails applications that are just so messy. So how can we quickly assess the quality of the application? And of course, in our industry, we have two ways to do it. We can pay someone to do it, like Code Climate or Codacy, or we can use open source gems to do it for us. The funny thing is that paid services actually use these open source gems. So I'm going to talk about the open source gems. And these libraries are great for doing static code analysis. Basically reading every statement in the application and assi assigning a numeric value to it. And then at the end of the day, you get a 
complexity score for a particular file, Ruby file. There are libraries that do code coverage analysis. They run the test suite and they tell you which statements in your application has been exercised. And finally, there are tools that will tell you how many code smells there are in each file that you are about to maintain. Now, I've been talking a lot about quality and software quality, and I wanna talk a little bit about the definition of software quality. The problem is that there are hundreds of definitions. There are books written about software quality in itself. So I like things like this, where the IEEE says, yeah, it's the degree to which a system component or process meets implicit or explicit requirements. And sure, there was a committee that wrote this and it makes perfect sense. But to me, it just means, yeah, it works as expected. Now, to me, this is a part of quality, but I'm going to, I'm going to be maintaining this software. So it's not just that. I don't care only about it working. I also care about the, the, how difficult it will be to maintain it. So it works as, as expected, and it's not a pain to maintain it. And sure, in software quality, there's also the ISO 9126-1 quality model that talks about all these five different aspects. And I'm not going to go into each and every one of these aspects, but I do want to focus on maintainability. And maintainability from the perspective of the software engineer that needs to work on the code base. The first thing that I care about is code coverage. Without tests, refactoring is a nightmare. You don't want to go there. You don't want to refactor production code that has no tests exercising it. So I find that this is the most important part. And secondly, we have code quality. Now, I can improve code quality, but it becomes so much harder without the first thing, without code coverage. Okay, so for code coverage, we have SimpleCov. SimpleCov simple is a super simple gem that you have to load before you start running the, your test suite, and it will generate an H HTML report for you. You install it like this, you load it like this, and this is for a Ruby application, so it's a little complicated for a Ruby application, but if you're doing it for a Rails application, it looks more like this, where SimpleCov has profiles that it can use to generate a report that is Rails friendly. And we also want to wrap this with an environment variable just to make sure that we don't run it, run it every time, but only when we want to see the coverage report. And then you execute it like this. You say coverage equals true, run our spec or mini test or whatever. And then we can see an HTML report of the application. Now this is a very simple application and it's uh, only a few files. And here we get our first signal. We got this project that we know nothing about and we run SimpleCov and now at least we get a signal that says, yeah, you know, out of all the files, 82% of all those files are covered by a test. It doesn't tell us whether the tests are good or bad. It just tells us that the statements have been exercised um, up to 82%. For code quality, is a little different. We have a lot of options. We have flog, flay, rake, Ruby critic, metric foo. I don't want to go over all of them because I'm pretty sure I'm missing some. But uh, the one that I really like is called Ruby critic. It's quite an active open source project and it uses some of the tools that I just mentioned. It uses flog, it uses reek, and it uses git to calculate all the metrics that you care about. Now the first one that it calculates is churn. Churn is how many times has a file changed since the beginning of the application. And for that, we have this very useful tool called git. Now with git log, we can see that this particular file, the default.rb, has changed three times. 
So the churn count for a file like that, it's three. Now in itself, that metric is not that important. It can tell you, yes, these are the most changed files in your application. But later it becomes super interesting when you combine churn with things like complexity, which is the second metric. Complexity, uh, Ruby Critic uses flog to calculate uh, complexity for a file. Flog is a really cool Ruby gem by Ryan Davis from Seattle RB. And you can use it like this. You say flog foo.rb and it tells you, yes, the flog score is 11.2. Now, what does that mean? Like, I have no idea what that means. It's like a number that has no meaning. So, okay, what it does is it reads every statement in a file and it assigns a numerical value to every operation in every statement. So for instance, an assignment is worth, is worth uh, 1.2, an eval is 6.0, an if is 1.2, and so on and so forth. So the flock score for a file is the sum of all the flock scores of all the methods. And that's cool. Yeah, we also have the complexity of every file. We can find all the most complicated files in our application. But it becomes more interesting when you combine churn and complexity. Ruby Critic will generate a report that will place every single file in your application in this uh, X and Y axis graph. So for, let's say, user.rb changed two times, but complexity is 100,000 you'll find it to the left and to the upper uh, section. And if user.rb has changed 27 times, but complexity is just 100, you'll find it in the lower right quadrant. Now later, you can use this information for, for good. To run Ruby Critic, it's pretty simple. You just gem install it, you run the Ruby Critic command, and by default, it will generate this nice looking HTML report. Great, but what does it mean? Okay, let's go into it. So in the pie graph, you'll see that every file has a GPA score. Now, for those of you who didn't go to school in the US, like me, uh, GPA, when I say GPA, thinks 100% to 0% in terms of like a test score. So A being 100%, F being 0%. Now every file in this application has been graded based on complexity and code smells. Complexity comes from flog and code smells come from reek. And here's another signal, right? We're looking at all these files and we see that about 60% of them are either an A or a B and maybe about 15% are an F or red right there. Cool. All right, then in terms of churn versus complexity, you can see a lot of files, a lot of little dots in this uh, X and Y axis. Cool, what, what does it mean? Like, what do I do with this? Like, that's, that's awesome, but I need to understand it to know what I can do with this. So if I look at the X and Y axis, I'd see a lot of files. And it helps me a lot to think about uh, adding an asymptote like this one. And this helps me just divide the four quadrants in the graph. Now, Ruby Critic will not add the asymptote. It's just like you have to imagine it to separate the files in different categories. And we're gonna go and look at all the quadrants. Now, in the lower left quadrant, you have the good place. That's where you want to be. You want your files to be low churn and low complexity. That means that they're not complex, so they're simple to understand, and they haven't been changing that much. Now, before the talk, I run a few uh, commands to generate this for Solidus. So I'll show some graphs for our Solidus core, actually. So Solidus core is doing really well. Great job. <laughs> cool. 
Now to the upper left section or in the upper left quadrant, you have files that are super complex, but nobody touches them or they, they don't change that much. And Sandy Metz says something like this. If the code never changes, it's not costing us money. So maybe not top priority for you. For Solidus Core, we find it's just like a helper file. So it doesn't really matter that much that a helper file for your tests is up there. Not a top priority. So, and it looks like there's only one of them up there. Now in the lower right quadrant, it's interesting. We get to see files that are low complexity by high, but high churn. And that means that, yeah, there are a lot of files in there that everybody understands, but they change a lot because there are reasons like, I don't know, like a label file or a translations file gets to show up there because your client keeps wanting you to change the labels and all that. Now for solid a score, it's really cool. There's only one of them there. And it kind of makes sense that a configuration file keeps changing and changing, but it's like low complexity. Again, this is not the quadrant that is your priority. So it's okay. Now we finally get to the most interesting quadrant. Here, you get to see modules that are complex and change a lot. And Michael Feathers says something interesting about this. Both Sandy Metz and Michael Feathers have written about this topic, about evaluating churn and complexity, and they are, they, they've been a great inspiration for this talk. So he says, sometimes a class becomes so complex that refactoring seems too difficult. So they're there, not because you don't want to refactor them, you do. You want to get rid of those complex and high churn files and move them, move them to the lower left corner but they're just so hard to understand and maybe there are no tests covering those files. The good news for Solidus is that there's only one file there, which is the importer order. Okay, good, good to know. Maybe you can just remove it. <laughs> cool. So looking at this graph, we get a bunch of signals, right? We get to see all those quadrants and we know what shape our application is, is in. We kind of get to answer this question. Are we getting ourselves into a tar pit, a dumpster fire, or a truly maintainable project? And sometimes it's not that easy, okay? Like, actually it is easy with like the Solidus core thing, the, you see that you're in really good shape. But sometimes you'll see something like this. And you'll say, okay, like most of the files are in the upper right quadrant, so maybe I should get out of here as quickly as possible. And if you say like, yeah, this is fine, you are getting yourself in this state. Cool. So in terms of maintainability, we talked about two things, SimpleCov and RubyCritic for the two factors that I care about. And you can think about it as an EKG for every time you go to the doctor. You see all these three signals and they're talking about the same application. They're talking about code coverage, they're talking about code smells, and they're talking about complexity. Now I like to think about this as signals. First signal is about code coverage, cool. Second signal is about complexity. Now, both of the signals are for the same code base. So you can put them in the same graph. They are both showing you one aspect of your application. And I what I want to propose is this. What if we could combine those two signals into one? Just one signal that tells us what's the health of our project. I like to call that one the stink score. The stink score is going to be a combination of code coverage and complexity. Think about it this way. It's gonna be the function of code quality and code coverage. And 
as I said, code quality is a bunch of things. So it's gonna be the function of code smells, churn, complexity, and code coverage. And the main idea behind this is that files that are not covered by any tests should be penalized. Let's see it in an example, okay? This, I love to learn by example, so this definitely makes it easier for me to explain it. Let's say we have foo.rb. It has churn, complexity, and smells at 10. We multiply all three of them, and we get the score of 1,000. Cool. Let's say we have another file called bar, and bar has exactly the same parameters, exactly the same total for smells. If we put them side by side, we can compare them and say, well, they're about the same, right? Like, so foo is not stinkier than bar, and bar is not stinkier than foo. Cool. But we're missing that signal that I was talking about, code coverage. So let's think about it if we had code coverage for the same files. foo.rb has 0% code coverage. I believe this file needs to be penalized in a way that bumps the score or the stink score up to 100,000. Now this is pretty simple math. The pen penality factor or the, the punishment factor is perfect coverage minus the total coverage of the file. So for this case, it's 100. Now let's look at bar RB. It's covered at 100%. Cool, that means that the stink score doesn't change. There's no penalty to the stink score. So let's look at them again, side by side. Are they the same? No, like when I look at them and I, when I'm going to decide which file I wanna change, I'm probably going to change the one with code coverage at 100%. So foo.rb is considerably stinkier than bar.rb. To make it easier for anyone to analyze their code base, I wrote a Ruby gem called Skunk. Because of course, Skunk knows all about the smells, right? They, they can go in and basically look at the source code and tell you the stink score for every file that you have. And you can find it over there. Um, and it builds on top of Ruby Critic. It uses reports generated by Ruby Critic and it uses reports generated by simple call. And it combines all that data into one single report. And you can install it today like this, and you can run it like this. So again, super simple. And you get a console output that looks like this. Now, this is a lot of data, and I don't want you to read all of this. The things that are important are right here we get a sorted list of every file in our application and it's sorted by the stink score. So here we can cl clearly see that git.rb is the stinkiest file in our application. So we don't need to run one report, run another, and then compare and cross-reference manually, which is we, what we had been doing at fastruby.io. At the end of the report, you also get a total. Now the totals are not that important, but they do tell you like the total stink score and the average stink, stink score per file. In terms of the implementation, Skunk uh, builds on top of Ruby Critic. Ruby Critic talks about cost as being the sum of all smells plus the complexity divided by a complexity factor, which is 25, because I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's interesting because it uses this cost value to assign the GPA for every file. So if a file has a ton of smells and it's super complicated, it will be an F. Now what I did in Skunk is I use uh, this cost formula and I multiply it by churn. So I want to care about every time that a file changes. So if a file has changed 27 times and it's costly, it's very costly, I want it to come up and bubble up to the top. 
And then what I do is I use the coverage percentage to punish the files that have very little code coverage. And the simple, it's, it's a simple formula, and I'm definitely looking for feedback here. So after the talk, I would love to hear what your thoughts about this. And I also want you to take uh, this as a warning. It is version 0 0.2, and there's, there are gonna be many changes to it. This tool helps us prioritize the files that we want to refactor in our day-to-day. So now we have three signals. We have code coverage, code quality, and the stink score, which is great because in part one, what we care about is drawing the map and putting us there in the, those are the La Brea pit, tar pits. Um, but now we know we are there and we can use that information to get out of it. All right. So now that we know where we are, let's try to get out of it. Cool, yes, we all want to go back you know, to work and we all want to refactor and we all want to write tests and we all wanna pay off technical debt. But where do we, 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 uh, where do we begin? We have 27 files that need our attention. How can we decide like what to do first? Well, the first one is my favorite, which is removing files off uh, from the project. Now, yes, that will certainly decrease the stink score because we will have less modules cluttering our application. There's a really cool tool for that. It's called uh, Cover Band. And think about it as a simple cov tool, but which uses real live production data to tell you the methods that are getting executed in production. So with CoverBand, you get a similar report than the one SimpleCov generated, and it does tell you which methods are getting executed on a day-to-day -day basis. You can use that to remove files, which would be cool. Another way to go about this is Yes, refactoring complex files. Cool, okay, I want to do that. I want to refactor a file and make it simpler, right? And if we look at this uh, graph again, these are great candidates for refactoring. This can help us pay off technical debt. But again, we have four files there, four classes that are super complex. And while churn and complexity are really important, it's not enough to prioritize it for me. I don't know which one I can pick that will be the sanest option for me. So going back to the stink score table, you can see the stink score and you can also see the code coverage report. So don't go refactoring the ones that have 0% test coverage that would be a nightmare. Pick the ones that have some code coverage, like the first one has 62% code coverage, the other ones right there have 80 something percent, which is great because if we can go in and refactor those, we will get instant feedback from the tests. So let's pick that one, uh, git.rb. We go and we check the graph and we see that git.rb is in the upper right quadrant which adds up. And we try to identify single responsibilities inside the file. We've been taught that we want the file to have one single responsibility. So if we find that that file has two responsibilities, awesome. We can refactor it into two smaller files that have one responsibility each. Cool, so now we'll have git fetcher and git calculator and that means that git.rb goes away. We refactor it, we make sure that the tests are green, and then um, we compare the skunk score to the state it was there uh, before we start refactoring. And if, it, if the numbers go down slightly, awesome. That means that we are moving in the right direction. Another great way to pay off technical debt is writing tests. Yes, that 
would definitely help us. And how do we prioritize which files we want to write tests for? Well, let's go back to the table. We can see that there are many files that have 0% uh, code coverage. Now here there is some um, guessing because a couple of those files are just test files and temp files that you don't really care about. But you do care about the right task file in there because it is doing something for the library. This is actually a report for the Ruby Critic gem, so it's pretty meta. And then you go in, you write the tests, and you again check the stink score to make sure that you are moving in the right direction. So I want to start a conversation about this. I want to show you the stink score to see what you can do with it. I want you to think about the stink score as your compass to get out of the tar pit. I don't want you to use this to point fingers, to use it the wrong way. This is a tool to prioritize refactoring and paying off technical debt. If you're not convinced by the stink score, <laughs> that's fine. You can just go in and use code coverage, complexity, and smells metrics to communicate that you are paying off technical debt to your boss. All of our bosses have heard this before. It's like, oh, the programmer before me was terrible, he did a terrible code base, yada, yada. They've heard it before. But if you can go in and show them the metrics off the code base, you'll have a lot more tools to convince them that it's worth it to spend time refactoring the code. So I hope that you find this talk interesting and that you can go back to work and use these tools to communicate better with your developer teammates, but also with your bosses. Thank you. There, there are a bunch of resources there that you can check out if you want to learn more about the source material for all this. Uh, and I think we have some time for questions, right? No? Okay, three minutes. Yeah. Um, since it seems testing and spec harvesting is the big bedrock of this, how do you go about assessing the quality of the test harvesting to make sure that you can actually get the correct things? Yeah. That's a, a great question. Like, how do you make sure that the tests are actually testing normal user flows, right? I don't have an answer for that. I have read that mutation testing can be useful for something like that, uh, where you go in and you start removing code from your application and you watch your tests either fail or work. Uh, I find that could be super useful if the tests are not representing reality. Like a lot of people, a lot of mockists like to use mocks to write tests and they mock them so well that sometimes Joe, yeah, code changes and the tests don't tell you that uh, things are gonna break. So uh, I guess it could, you could analyze every single test there is and like look at the balance between like system tests and unit tests and controller tests and but it would have to be like uh kind of like a qualitative assess assessment that you need to do yourself yeah how do you go about convincing non people of the value of paying off especially from the school like well they know don't fix it <laughs> yeah cool so yeah how do you convince people who yeah are not technical and they, yeah, they're like, if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> I think it comes down to velocity. Like they probably care about like how long you take to ship something. So I would go about it trying to talk about the speed and the velocity. I don't know if they know about the velocity, but you could make a claim that by paying off technical debt, you are going to be speedier when uh, making the changes, and changes are not going to take forever, like I said. W was there a question? Sorry, I didn't. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> All right, thank you.